Damn, that is pretty cool. I'm always happy when I'm here. Unfortunately, I do have to go. I'm getting a bunch of emails and the subs acting like a wild man. Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Some people dream of success while you're gonna wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible! You should get to the point where anyone else will quit and you're not gonna stop there! No! What are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! Anyways, I'll see you guys later. I appreciate the hospitality. If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. I'll take it from here, Shia. Appreciate you, bro. How's it going, AP Psych class? As you can see, I've just returned from my journey from inside of the brain, and I have a lot to tell you about. While in the brain, I met up with a pretty cool gang of neurotransmitters, and they told me everything there is to know about themselves. So I figured, why not share that with you guys? So the topic of today's lesson is going to be neurotransmitters, which are tiny chemical messengers located throughout the body. Your ability to perceive, feel, think, and react all depends on the delicate balance of neurotransmitters in your nervous system. Too much or too little of any given neurotransmitter can lead to a whole lot of issues both psychologically and physically. Interestingly enough, neurotransmitters are not very present in the human body. Trying to find one would be like trying to find a grain of salt in a swimming pool. There are over a hundred different types of neurotransmitters in the body, but luckily for us, we only need to know seven for the AP Psych test. Before we get into the specific types of neurotransmitters, it is important to understand the differences between an excitatory neurotransmitter and an inhibitory neurotransmitter. If a neurotransmitter is excitatory, it has an increased chance of performing an action potential and sending a message. So it is going to excite or speed up brain functions. While inhibitory neurotransmitters inhibit or slow down brain functioning. We are going to see that some neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, can be either excitatory or inhibitory, all depending on the specific receptor site that it binds to. Now let's get into our neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is going to play a role in learning and memory, but its main function is going to be triggering muscle contractions. Acetylcholine is one of the most understood neurotransmitters and it can be found in all motor neurons. A deficit of acetylcholine is shown in those suffering from Alzheimer's disease, which can explain why those with the disease experience issues with their memory. Dopamine is going to be involved in movement, attention, and pleasurable sensations. If the brain is not producing enough dopamine, individuals may experience shaking, stiffness, and difficulty with walking and balance, a disorder known as Parkinson's disease, cell damage in the substantia nigra area of the brain leads to a lack of dopamine production. Individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia are shown to have increased levels of dopamine production in the brain when experiencing symptoms. Known as the dopamine hypothesis, it states that schizophrenic symptoms can largely be explained by an increased level of dopamine production in the brain. Antipsychotic medications reduce the level of dopamine production in the brain in order for psychotic symptoms to subside. This is not always side effect free as the lack of dopamine production caused by the medication can lead to something known as movement disorders induced by antipsychotic drugs. Our happy neurotransmitter, serotonin, is involved in sleep, mood, and emotional states. A deficit of serotonin can lead to an individual experiencing symptoms of depression. As I've talked about before, SSRIs are a class of antidepressant that block the reuptake of serotonin in order for the chemical to flood the synaptic gap. In theory, when someone is experiencing symptoms of depression, this influx of serotonin should help with raising their mood. Norepinephrine is going to be involved in heart rate and physiological arousal, as well as learning and memory retrieval. When we perceive a stimuli or situation as threatening, our body releases an excess of norepinephrine. This excess leads to an increased heart rate, as well as a heightened sense of alertness. You may already know this process as our fight or flight response. If the brain consistently produces an excess of norepinephrine, it can lead to the individual experiencing symptoms of anxiety. 
Next up we have my favorite neurotransmitter, gamma immunobutyric acid, or GABA for short. The main purpose of GABA is going to be to help offset excitatory messages as well as regulate the sleep-wake cycle. GABA is going to be the body's major inhibitory neurotransmitter, allowing to slow down brain activity when appropriate. A deficit of GABA can lead to symptoms of anxiety due to the constant excitatory brain activity. Glutamate is going to be our body's major excitatory neurotransmitter. Glutamate is very prominent in the brain. About 60% of our neurons contain glutamate, and virtually every neuron has a glutamate receptor site. Glutamate is going to contribute to prenatal and childhood brain development, but its most important role has to do with learning and memory. If our brain has an excess of glutamate, it can lead to psychological issues with anxiety or depression, and at too high of a level, glutamate causes brain cell death. When a neuron's receptor site is constantly being stimulated, a process known as excitotoxicity occurs where a neuron is either damaged or killed due to overactivation at the receptor site. This is because the excess of glutamate allows for high level of calcium ions to enter the neuron. This influx of calcium ions activates a number of enzymes that go and damage several cell structures. And for our final neurotransmitter, we have endorphins. Endorphins are going to be an inhibitory neurotransmitter involved in pain perception and positive emotions. If you have ever experienced what is known as a runner high. This is the result of an influx of endorphins that are released as a result of you running. Something I've never experienced in my life. I hate running. I try and run as fast as I can just so it can be over with quicker. Endorphins also serve as the body's natural pain reliever. Stronger even than morphine. So those are the seven neurotransmitters that you need to know about. But before I send you on your way, there is just one more thing we need to talk about. We will come to see that substances such as psychoactive drugs causes a disruption in our balance of neurotransmitters. These substances can be either categorized as agonist or anti Antagonist. An agonist refers to a drug or substance that effectively mimics the action of a natural chemical messenger within the body. Any type of opiate is considered an endorphins agonist because they are able to bind to endorphin receptor sites activating the neuron. Antagonists are going to refer to a substance that are going to work to reduce the action of an agonist by preventing the agonist substance from binding with a receptor site. Antagonists are kind of like the bouncers of the neuron, not letting in any bad seeds. A popular example of an antagonist is a drug named naloxone, commonly referred to as Narcan which works by binding with opiate receptor sites without activating them, blocking out other substances. All right, what well, does it for me? I think if I'm fast enough, I can catch up to Shia. Peace.